Hey y'all, it's Pastor Taylor here, and I am a servant here at Relevant Church. And whether it's your first time with us or your hundredth time, I just want to personally say, welcome home. I am so excited that each and every one of you have decided to hop on Church Online to an experience, an amazing worship experience. On Easter Sunday, we have so much in store for you. Also, if you are not plugged into ReFam, get plugged in. In Refam is our private Facebook group, and you can go there to get connected and make just personal impacts on each other. And you can learn what's coming up here at Relevant. Speaking of that, let's go ahead and get into some of those events. So on April 20th, we have our Highlighter Youth Party. It is going to be so much fun. If you know all about youth, they know how to have a good time. So. Go ahead, if you have any youth, get them signed up at thisisrelevant.cc forward slash events. It's happening April 20th at 6.30 p.m. April 24th is Baptism Sunday. If you are interested in making a public declaration of your faith, get signed up today. That's April 24th. It's going to be Baptism Sunday. And then happening on May 8th is Mother's Day. We are here to celebrate all the moms out there here at Relevant Church. Come on down, bring your mom, bring your grandmother, and especially bring your kids to celebrate all the moms. That's on May 8th here at Relevant Church at 10 a.m. If you missed any of the events that I just talked about, go ahead and head to thisisrelevant.cc forward slash events. And did you know that all of this is made possible through partners like you with your contributions to Relevant Church? We just want to thank you so much. Check out this video from one couple who has decided to give their treasures and their time to Relevant Church. Hey everyone, I'm Isaac. I'm Sophie. And we are the Popes. We've been coming to Relevant for about six months now. So I serve on the worship team. I uh, play guitar and lead worship. Yeah, um, I also am on the worship team. I get to sing and I also am helping out in re-kids. I love in um, re-kids and in worship team, just the excitement and the passion that they have. Um, for sharing Jesus with the kids and then like for the worship team, just um, encouraging people to worship and get excited about God. That's been really fun to be a part of. We really enjoy the worship experience. One thing that's been really cool for us is um, I feel like Relevant honestly has reignited our uh, the worship for us. Um, we actually started coming to Relevant um, because we were really looking for a church in our local area here in Niles and we wanted a place that we could invite people to um, and kind of bring to a church that was excited about Jesus. We really just just enjoyed it. It's been great. We love the people here. Uh, we feel like we've been making some really good friendships and uh, just feels like the whole church is striving after what God wants um, for us all. I enjoy Isaac and Sophie so much. And I believe that we give because God gave. If you remember John 3, 16, it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That is why we give a tenth back to God is because he has already given us his son who died on the cross for our sin. And now as we're celebrating today has rose again. And so we cannot just be grateful enough. So just know that all of your contributions that you make to Relevant Church are going to a good place. Now there are three ways to give and they're all listed on your screen. Now let's pray over our giving. God, I just thank you so much for each and every person who is watching online right now. And I just pray that as they are deciding on whether or not they will give to your kingdom to partner with Relevant Church, I just pray that um, you allow them to be a cheerful, cheer, cheerful giver today and um, allow them to realize that you have given us the ultimate sacrifice, which is your son, Lord. And I just pray that you continue to bless everyone and continue to um, bless your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Now lean in because we have a special Easter message 
just for you. What's up, guys? Welcome home. I'm so glad that you decided to join us for another broadcast here at Relevant Church. Happy Easter. This is the best day to jump on this broadcast. So if this is your first time, go ahead and chat in the, drop it in the chat. Say, this is my first time. Would love to know. Tell us where you're watching from. Maybe you've already posted it already. Our MC probably already invited you to do that. But I want to know where you're watching from as well, too. I want to celebrate uh, where you're at. Are you on your couch? Are you at home? Are you at work? Uh, let us know. Hey, we're so glad that you decided to join us. You could have been anywhere else. Do me a favor. Before I go even further, go ahead and share this with somebody. I believe that this is going to be a transform transformative message for you, for your family, for your friends. So uh, tag one of your coworkers if you have to. Uh, God wants to meet them in and through this message. My name is Muta, and I get to be one of the servants here at Relevant Church. My wife and I get to serve as the lead pastors here. And at Relevant, we want to do one thing and one thing well. And there's no greater day than to help everybody discover that Jesus is relevant. That's what we want to do at Relevant Church. We want to help everybody know that Jesus is relevant. And today is Easter, so this is the day to help everybody discover that Jesus is relevant. And because Jesus is relevant, we want to create an atmosphere where we learn to passionately follow Jesus, love across boundaries, and then go out and make a tangible difference in our community, our region, and our world. And listen, if that fires you up, if you're watching for the first time, or maybe you've watched this for quite a few times and you're like, man, I, I want to be plugged into Relevant Church. Listen, it doesn't matter where you're at. You could be in Tucson, Arizona. You could be in Scandinavia. You can be in Australia. You can be in California or you can be right here in the Michigan, Indiana region. You can be a part of Team Relevant even if you watch online. I would invite you to go to Facebook and type in Relevant Refam, R-E-F-A-M. You get plugged into our private Facebook group. You can uh, connect with the community, develop relationships because at Relevant, we don't want to just be friendly. We want to make friends. So jump onto our private Facebook group. Let everybody know, hey, I'm new around here and let us draw you in and invite you to be a part of the family as well too so you may not have facebook you may not be uh online on social media there's still opportunities for you to be a part of team relevant go ahead and text connect right there in the chat let everyone know that you want to connect and our uh online digital dream team We'll connect with you, we'll probably send you a private message or even just begin a conversation with you right there. We want you to not have to do faith alone. Can I tell you, God created us for community and you get to be in community even if you're watching uh, from across the seas or across the states. Hey, at Relevant, we always want to give honor to where honor is due. We want to shout out some special individuals that have just been contributing at such a, uh, a unique and a phenomenal way. And there's two sets of individuals I want to uh, share with you. The first individuals are Jim and Cindy Gumper. Let me show you this picture real quick. This is Jim and Cindy, unsolicited, showed up to the church and said, hey, it's Easter weekend and we want to make sure that the property looks good. And so they have been clearing rocks and cutting the lawn and making sure the place looks beautiful. Can we celebrate Jim and Cindy real quick? Come on, let's throw some uh, hands raised emojis or some clapping hands emojis or some boom emojis. However we want to celebrate them, let's celebrate Jim and Cindy for being such faithful, faithful team members here at Team Relevant. The second group of individuals, I want to call them the Patchwork Crew. The Patchwork Crew, I showed up on property, as many of you guys know, uh, when we moved into this property, the whole property was not completed yet, so our parking lot is still kind of undone. Uh, we're going to work on it in due time, but there was a couple of potholes right when you drove into the driveway. Well, I pull in, and I see uh, Denver, and I see Mike, and I see uh, Joe out there patching up the potholes. Again, unsolicited. I never asked them to do this. No one asked them to do this. They decided out of the goodness and the generosity of their own hearts that they wanted to make sure that everybody who drives on property has a great experience and doesn't lose an axle. So go ahead and let's celebrate these three individuals. Let's celebrate all five of these individuals again, because we just want to say we're grateful for them being a part of Team Relevant. All right, guys, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 
14, beginning in verse 9. Exodus chapter 14, beginning in verse 9. You should have it on the screen for you. Let me read it. It says, the Egyptians pursued them. Who are them? The Israelites. It says, the Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them encamped at the sea at that place. I'm not going to try to impress you with uh, amazing uh, pronunciations of all this uh, biblical text. You can read it. It's there. It said, when Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them. They feared greatly. The world's superpower is coming after this group of individuals. They feel trapped. They're at the Red Sea. Be in front of them is the Red Sea. Behind them is this oncoming army that is about to overtake them. And they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. And they said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness. What have you done to us bringing us out of Egypt? Is not what we said to you in Egypt. Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And then Moses, their fearless leader, says these amazing words. And I want you to underline them. If you've got a Bible, underline them, circle them, highlight them. If you've got your Bible app on your phone, go ahead and you highlight this. It says, and Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work out for you today. For the Egyptian whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. That's epic. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word. Speak to us in the only way you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'm not a huge fan of chess. I'm going to be real to you. I love checkers. Uh, I like it easy. Chess is a little bit too complicated, and I ain't built like that. Uh, I just like being able to double stack in my chess and say, king me, and so I can run all over the board and eat up everybody's pieces. But chess is a game of strategy. That's what I know about it. And in chess, you've got all these pieces that are trying to accomplish one goal. They're trying to entrap the king of the opponent. Because in chess, once you surround the king, you can yell checkmate, and right there, it's game over. And there's this painting I want to show you real quick. This painting was painted uh, hundreds of years ago. And this painting is of two individuals playing chess. As you can see, one individual's got his head slumped over. Obviously, he doesn't look like he's winning. He doesn't seem like he's on the winning team. Then you got another individual that's staring at him, glaring at them with this, I've got you trapped. What are you going to do now? This painting is called Checkmate, and oftentimes at chess competitions, it's in the backdrop as a reminder of what the game of chess is like. And oftentimes, life feels like a game of chess, where you feel entrapped all around, and you feel like everything is coming after you. You know, I love movies, especially the ones that have epic fight scenes. Movies where there's one individual, there's a sole uh, individual who's about to take out an army or take out a group of people that are coming after them. There's a movie back in the day called Scarface. Yes, Pastor watched Scarface. If you've never watched it before, don't go watch it. It's okay. Uh, Scarface had this character called Tony Montana. He's this big drug lord and kingpin. And in the final scenes of the movie, he's in his office. He's into an issue with this woman who's coming after him. And she's shooting a gun to him. And somebody comes up behind him and shoots the woman. And he actually loved this woman. And so he's mad. And he ends up killing the other dude. And as he's turning around, he looks at these TV screens of his property and he sees that he's being infiltrated and he is being surrounded and he freaks out and he he gets upset, but he's all drugged up right now. He's got so much adrenaline going through him. He goes and grabs the biggest gun in his gun closet and he says, listen, I am the king of the world. You think you can mess with me? I'm Tony Montana. And he grabs his gun and he cocks it and he puts all the the magazines in his pocket and he's getting ready for the fight of his life. And I just remember this scene, the most famous scene where he goes, say hello to my little friend. 
and he shoots the gun and he blows apart his uh, office door and he runs outside and he starts going into this epic battle. Everybody's shooting at him. He's shooting at everybody else. And he gets hit a couple of times, but Tony is not the one to go down easy. In fact, uh, the, the screen pans down and in his foyer of his house, there's this globe and it says the world is yours. And that's who Tony believes he is. He believes he's the king of his own life. He's the king of the world. And sure enough, he is giving it to them. He's shooting everybody and it's epic. There's blood everywhere and everybody's uh, shooting and, and it's loud. And I know everybody's watching like, why are we talking about shooting guns on Easter? Listen, follow me. It's, it's going to get good. And all the dudes on here are like, yeah, I remember that scene. But anyway, he's shooting all these people. Unbeknownst to him, he is truly surrounded because there's somebody coming up behind him. And this person is walking ever so slowly. And they've got a shotgun in their hand. And as Tony Montana is getting everybody and he thinks he's on the winning side, the guy behind him shoots him in the back. And we see this scene of Tony Montana falling into the pool in his foyer, in his house. And there's another movie, if you grew up in the hip hop generation, a movie called Belly. It was pretty much a, a take of uh, Scarface. There's this individual called Lennox, they call him Ox. He's also another kingpin, another individual who is le leading a life that is not the safest. And he's drawing all types of attention to him. And people don't like him because he thinks he rules the world and he thinks he's untouchable. And he's got this epic home that looks like the White House. It's crazy. It's huge. It's white. They're in Jamaica. And in the scene that we find Lennox, he's on his couch. He's watching soccer. His team is losing, and he's getting so frustrated. He ends up dropping this, 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 this module that has all these screens on there where he could see all the camera angles in his house. When he picks it up, he stumbles down, and he sees that he, too, is surrounded like Tony Montana. And like Tony Montana, Lennox gets up, and he's not one to go down without a fight, so he goes and grabs his gun. And throughout the, this whole scene, you, you hear him yelling out all these expletives. And he says, listen, do you want to test me? I'm ox. I'm untouchable. He's like, man, I, I murder people for fun. He says, I'm the original Jamaican Don Dada. And he goes and he starts shooting. And he's shooting everybody. He's surrounded. But lo and behold, he's able to hold his own. He is shooting up the house. He runs out into the foyer, just like the scene in Scarface. And he is getting everybody. And unbeknownst to him, again, there's this quiet assailant who is behind him. This masked individual is up on his banister. And in one scene, she jumps over the banister, jumps on the back of Ox, and literally slits his throat just that easy, just like an ox. It's crazy because oftentimes we watch these movies and we are celebrating the villain. We want Tony Montana to win. We know he's not the good guy. He's the bad guy, but we want him to win. And we want Ox to win. We want him to be victorious. We want him to be vindicated, even though he is the villain. Can I tell you, the villain always dies. They get surrounded and they die. And can I tell you why I think we love these stories, these epic stories? Because in reality, that is us. We are the villains of our own lives. Can we just be real here? I don't know about you, but I'm not perfect. I've made a lot of mistakes in life. And I know if you're watching this and you've got breath in your lungs, you've probably made some mistakes in your lives. You've probably had some bad conversations. You've probably made some bad deals. You've probably cussed somebody out. Or you've probably had some negative thoughts. Or maybe just sinned against the living God and lived a life that you're not supposed to live. And the reality is when we're watching these movies, we're celebrating these individuals because we want to wait out when we're surrounded. Because the reality of it, we know that our life has not been lived to the best of our ability. So if they can get out, then hopefully we can get out. Can I tell you, Isaiah 53, 6 puts it plainly about you and I. It says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. We've turned our backs on God. 
Even in our best days, the Bible says we are like filthy rags. There is selfishness, there's pride in you and I. And you know what the result is? Just like the villain in the story. Romans 6.23 tells us plainly the wages of sin is death. See, Lennox was living a life of sin and he dies in the movie because that's what he deserved. Tony Montana was living a life of sin and he dies in the movie. Do you know why? Because the wage of sin is death. And the reality is our sin condemns us. Our shame convicts us. And lo, let us stand here and be saying, oh, no, I'm good. I'm not that bad. I'm not that terrible situation. There's people who are worse than me. Can I tell you, our pride petitions our indictment. Our brokenness bears witness to our guilt. All of us are the villains in the story. Our life is not perfect. And we see just like the Israelites, they are surrounded. In front of them is the Red Sea. Behind them is the oncoming army. We look at the backstory of this. These individuals have been in slavery for 400 years to the Egyptian nation. God comes and he sees these people who are broken, busted, disgusted, and bruised. And he says, man, you know what? I'm going to make a great nation out of you guys. So I'm going to rescue you from slavery. And this is all to fulfill what God had started to do many years ago. Decades, hundreds, a thousand years ago. When God promised a certain man. That his ancestors, not his ancestors, his, his, the individuals who come after him, his offspring, would literally be blessed by God. They would be able to inherit a new land. They would be able to populate the earth. And through them, the whole world was going to be blessed. And so finally, they've been released from slavery. And they've been rescued from slavery. And there's hope finally coming back. There's joy coming back. There's celebration taking, uh, 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 taking shape. Unfortunately, it's halted by the impending doom. They need rescue again. And I bet you they're sitting there like, they're, we're not horrible people. We didn't ask to leave Egypt. Moses, you came to get us. We were fine serving the Egyptians. We were well-meaning families. We actually had homes. We had uh, families. We had children. There were young adults there looking at their future. There were students thinking about what life would be like when they get older. And they felt like, why is this happening to us right now? Why are we surrounded? Can I tell you, life is like that. You feel like you're making progress, then the other shoe drops. You feel trapped. And somebody watching this may be feeling trapped in your own life right now. You may be feeling surrounded with the pressures of life. It might be financial. It might be bad relationships. It might be uh, that you're addicted to uh, something, whether it's a substance or whether it's uh, just a practice that you just don't want to be involved in. Maybe you're in debt and the, the financial strain is just coming over you. Or maybe you've made some bad choices in life and you feel ashamed. You're in a state of vulnerability. And maybe you're wondering, God, I didn't ask for this. I didn't ask for my, my health to decline or my wealth to decline. I didn't ask for this depression to come to my life. I, I didn't ask to get pregnant so young. I, I didn't ask to uh, live a life of being a failure. And you're wondering, God, how did I get here? And that's what's happening with the Israelites they only have doom and death ahead. It's like go back and be enslaved again or go forward and drown in this sea ahead of us. But then God shows up. God shows up. And I love what it says in verse 15. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the people of Israel may go through the sea 
on dry ground. God uses Moses. God says, listen, I'm going to part the sea. Just go ahead and lift your staff. I'm going to do the miraculous. And I know somebody watching this is like, man, I wish God can do the miraculous in my life. Because I feel like I'm standing between a rock and a hard place. But can I tell you, in order for them to be rescued this second time, in order for them to be delivered this time, they had to go down into the depths of the sea to experience freedom. Man, I wish I could preach that a little longer. Sometimes you're going to have to reach the pit before you receive your freedom. Sometimes it's going to have to feel like you're surrounded all around you. I want you to picture this moment. There's an army coming after them. The sea is in front of them. Now they've got to trust Moses that if they go forward, that they'll be able to walk on dry ground. They see Moses put his staff over the water. The water creates these walls on their sides. Imagine having to walk through that. You will feel like you're delusional. You will feel like you're going crazy. This is not happening. This is a dream. This can't be real. I cannot be walking on dry ground while I'm seeing all types of fishes come by me on this wall, on this aquarium that God has created in the middle of the sea. Can I tell you, when God shows up, he does the miraculous. When God shows up, sometimes you'll feel delusional. When God shows up, you'll wonder, how in the world is this happening? Because our God is a God of a new possible. God doesn't just want to get you out of an impossible situation. He wants to create a new possible. He wants to uh, blow your mind. As it says in Isaiah 43, 19, behold, I am doing a new thing, and now it springs forth. They had to go through the pit to experience God's power. And we see In the final hours of Jesus, he's in the garden called Gethsemane. Jesus is surrounded, literally. One of his disciples, one of the individuals he spent three years teaching, investing, and pouring his life into, decides to betray him for 30 pieces of silver. And so Jesus ends up now falling into the hands of this crowd that wants nothing to do but kill him. He ends up going into a fraudulent trial. He ends up being beaten down and bruised. His flesh is torn. His body is marred. His exhaustion is real. And then they've got the nerve to put a wooden cross on his back. And as he's being led to the place where he's going to be crucified, they see a man walking by, a guy named Simon. And they tell Simon, hey, come and help this guy out. Put his cross on your back. Can I tell you? Simon didn't put Jesus' cross on his back because the cross that Jesus carried was Simon's cross. That was my cross. It was your cross. Jesus was innocent. Jesus was not the villain. Jesus was the innocent one surrounded, wrongfully accused, yet he died. Yet he received the spear in his side. Yet he had to go and be buried in the tomb. An innocent man who had one purpose, to seek and save the lost, to bring hope to the hopeless, to bring health to the sick, to bring healing to the broken, to bring life to those that were dead, yet He lost his life. But can I tell you, the king had another move. Scripture tells us that early Sunday morning, God did the miraculous. 
Jesus Christ did not stay in the grave. D Jesus Christ did not stay with his body broken. He was made anew and early Sunday morning he walked out of the tomb. He walked out of the tomb victorious. This wasn't just the villain who was killed because of what he deserved. This was the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, who was killed for you and I, who took on the pain and the punishment for you and I. And he walks out victorious because the King had another move. Back to the story of the painting. The painting once stood in a famous museum in France. And the story is told of a grandmaster of chess and his friend walking through the museum and stopping and looking at this painting. And his friend, who wasn't really familiar with the whole game of chess, could not understand why this man, this chess grandmaster, was so captivated with a game that he played essentially for a living. But this chess grandmaster was studying this painting and he was captivated by this painting. And he was so enthralled in this painting. And at one moment, he begins to yell. The artist is wrong. The painting is wrong. The king still has another move. See, what the chess grandmaster figured out, that although the artist drew this painting with this perplexed situation, perplexing situation, where this man feels like his king is surrounded, where he feels like all hope is lost, where he feels like there's no way out, this chess grandmaster saw that the king had another move. And while Jesus laid in the tomb and all his disciples fled and all of earth was downtrodden and sad because the king was dead, they did not know that the king had another move. And can I tell you, the king still has another move. The, just like God had another move for the Israelites at the Red Sea, the king had another move at the tomb. And the same king who can part the Red Sea and raise Jesus from the grave is the same king who has another move for your life. The king has another move. And if you're watching this, I want to let you know the king still has another move. You may feel like all hope is gone. You may feel like you are at the end of your limits. You may feel like you are at your wits end. You may feel like all hope is lost. Can I tell you, the king has another move over your life. Scripture tells us about a man named Job. Job lost everything. He lost his children. He lost his home. He lost his health. He lost his business, his property. In fact, he got to the point where he was so destitute that even his wife came to him and said, why don't you just curse God and die? But the king still had another move for Job's life. It says, and after this, Job lived another 140 years. Can I tell you, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, yet he will live. Because the king always has another move. And on this Easter Sunday, I want you to put your faith and your trust in the king that always has another move. I don't know what you've done. I don't know where you've been. I don't know what life has been like for you. But can I tell you that with Jesus, there is always another move. And today, if you put your faith, if you put your trust in the man who took on your sin, who took on the death that you deserved, but rose on the third day, 
ascended to heaven and is preparing a place for you and I. This is what it says. God loved the world so much that he sent his son, Jesus, that if you believe in him, there would be another move for your life. Would you put your trust in the one who always has another move? Let's pray. God, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you so much for the story of the gospel. The God we did not deserve to live. We don't deserve to live. We are the villains. We've sinned against you. We've sinned against Jesus. We've turned our backs from you. But because of Jesus, our life doesn't just have to look bleak and have death as a result. There is yet another move, and it's called life, and life abundantly on this side of heaven, and life eternally in heaven with you. Hear our prayer today. Forgive us, make us whole. And Lord, we give you permission to make another move over our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Happy Easter. Remember, the king has another move.
goodness that was amazing I took so many notes you have you have no idea how many notes I just took but now let's close out like we always do relevant church may you learn to passionately follow Jesus love across boundaries and make a tangible difference in your community region and world I'll see you next week